Lord God, you give the world new life by mysteries which are beyond our grasp. May your church not be deprived of earthly help while she makes progress by the strength of these eternal gifts. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So lovely to see you again, and um, just to remind you yet again, I'm sure most of you know this by now, but for about the next 30 minutes, I'm going to speak, uh, looking mainly at some texts this week from the prophets, and then at the end of that time, um, just have about 10 minutes reflecting quietly, meditating on some of those texts, just to try and reflect on what I've said, but also what those texts may be saying to you tonight. And then about quarter to eight, we'll uh, divide up into chat rooms. Some of you may wish to leave by that stage uh, and uh, just for you to talk among yourselves about things that have come to you in this period of uh, time together. And then finally, for those who want to stay on, we'll have half an hour of discussion and questions. So, um, just starting again from this uh, place that I always start back in Genesis, that the texts there really tell us that we are above all created for relationship, to live in harmony with others, other human beings, and indeed with the earth, the habitat in which we live, uh, and indeed with everything on earth or the creatures of the earth. Above all, we are created to live in good relationship in harmony with God, our creator. However, those harmonious relationships have been disrupted and the story of the Old Testament is about how our relationships with God and indeed with others and with the whole earth may be recreated. A key moment in the restoration of the relationships is the encounter between Moses, uh, the ancient Israelite, and God on Mount Sinai, where God gives uh, Moses and the people of Israel instructions about how they are to restore those relationships with one another, with the earth, and above all, with God. They are to uh, help one another to live uh, rightly and well by treating each other justly. And they are to listen to the Lord their God and to love him with all their hearts and minds and soul and their strength. Mm -hmm. um, four books of the Bible, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy, deal with the character of Moses. At the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. I'd just like to read, first of all, first slide will be having a look at what is said about Moses at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. Just one verse here. It says, never since then has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Well, we've heard about that deep and intimate relationship which develops between Moses and the living God, which can be said how Moses comes to know the Lord intimately and deeply, face to face, as it were. But now we discover that this distinguishing feature of Moses makes of him a prophet. Uh, this is what is characteristic of a prophet. We're going to explore more about that this week. We also heard last week that in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, the evil that King David did, we were encountered another prophet. The prophet Nathan came to David to confront him with the evil that he had done. So let's just quickly read through that account again. So Nathan the prophet comes to David and says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, You have despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his eyes. Why have you done this? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife, and you have slain him with a sword. This is the evil that David uh, and changes his life. Um, I've just got a message to say my uh, internet is unstable, so let's keep our, our fingers crossed that I'm not going to disappear. Anyway, still here for the moment. Um, anyway, from these two texts, if we just go on, Greg, to the next uh, slide, please. From these two texts, we know that a prophet is someone that knows the Lord face to face, has intimate relationship with the Lord, like the relationship that uh, the human beings had when they were first created in the Garden of Eden. And that secondly, 
prophets confront and expose what is evil, that is, prophets disturb and unsettle those to whom they speak. They present us with truths we would rather not hear. And the Old Testament tells us about some of these prophets who do just that, not only Moses and Nathan, but later prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Now, the word prophet is not only the name of individual characters in the Old Testament, but the prophets are those who give their name to a whole section of texts in the Old Testament, a block of books, or more particularly, or correctly, scrolls in the Old Testament are called the prophets. There are eight scrolls. Um, we today, as Christians, tend to speak of these scriptures, that those huge number of texts we use, the beginning of the Bible, we talk of that as the Old Testament. But Jews today often speak about their scriptures as Tanakh. That is, um, well, that is not a real word. That this is an acronym, and it stands. Uh, it's the capital, uh, the the consonants, the capital letters there, which tell us what the Bible is about, the Old Testament is about. It's about firstly Torah. T stands for Torah. Then it's about the prophets. Uh, the prophets in in Hebrew begins with the letter N, Nevi'im, and therefore it's uh, N in Tanakh. And the third letter, third consonant is K, which is the first letter of Ketuvim, which means writings, and is the third section of the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. We actually today, um, sorry, in the Christian uh, world, tend to divide the Old Testament into four sections. I won't describe that now. We can talk about that later if you'd like. Anyway, going back to the way uh, the, the uh, Jews divide the Old Testament as Tanakh, this second great section of the Bible um, tells us that um, so, so there are eight scrolls in this second section, and they, they are divided into four and four. The first four are known as the former prophets, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, which we call the historical books because they narrate the past of the people of Israel, and we talked a little bit about them last week. And then the other four books are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, the major prophets, and then 12 minor prophets. They're not minor because they're, they're little in size, but because they have less words than the major prophets and can all fit onto one scroll. So just one book of the Bible, as it were. And we're going to focus on these uh, four scrolls, these four major um, books, uh, four major scrolls of the latter prophets uh, this evening. Remembering, first of all, that a prophet who is someone who is in intimate relationship with God and who has a message to convey to people, and that message is often disturbing and challenging to us. Let's just have a quick look at another uh, thing that a prophet may mean. Um, the Hebrew word for a prophet is a navi. A navi comes from a root which seems to suggest uh, that someone calls or invokes, it perhaps is someone also who is called, who is called by God and therefore calls others. Because this person has a deep relationship with God, God speaks to them and their words become God's words, so that when they speak, they speak what God wants us to hear. And God wants us to hear this message of uh, justice upon earth and with others and also that we should be in right relationship with him. He calls us back to him. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Other words uh, which seem to be used for prophets are words which come from uh, verbs meaning to see. And so a prophet is also a seer, that is someone who has clearer, sharper sight than most of us average humans and who can penetrate to our hearts who with his words or her words exposes and purifies what is evil, who can alter our direction of travel to make us walk in true justice and in true love with the one who created us and with all creation. So if we think of a prophet as first of all someone who is called by God, we often hear in the prophets of uh, how they are called. And let's just read to now, now first of all, the call of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was the main uh, character I was going to look at tonight. We won't just look at Isaiah, but I want to use this uh, text now to think about what it is to be a prophet and uh, why I also spoke about uh, the prophetic word on fire. Here we see this 
transforming encounter of the man Isaiah with the living Lord. So just to read this text uh, uh, quite slowly. In that year, so in the year that King Uzziah died, I, that is Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne raised and lifted up and the hems of his robe filled the temple. This tells us quite a, a bit about the context of this uh, call of this man, Isaiah. It happened around the year 740 BC, the year that King Uzziah of Judah died. Remember last year, last year, last week, I spoke quite a bit about uh, the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. We'll remind you of that later on. But here is the king of uh, Judah, whose capital is Jerusalem, and at the heart of his capital is the temple. And the prophet sees uh, the Lord uh, high and raised up. He has a vision. It's a very intense and deep, physical, sensual experience. And he goes on that there are seraphim, literally those who are on fire, who are burning, standing around the Lord. And they call to one another and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And Isaiah is going to talk a lot in, the, in his oracles, in his prophecies about the holiness of God. Going on, it says, um, the prophet I says in response, woe is me, I am lost, destroyed. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, but my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So uh, he is seeing the Lord, he's hearing voices. Uh, again, that very sensual experience of this call. And then one of the seraphim flew to me. In his hand, there was a burning coal with tongs. He had taken it, uh, the, the coal from the altar and he touched my mouth with it. And again, not only seeing and hearing, but now touching. The lips which are unclean, not worthy to speak the words of God, are uh, cleansed and purified, ready to speak for God. So Isaiah is transformed. The part of the physical part of him that needs to be transformed, his lips are transformed, and he's ready to become the prophet, the one who speaks, who calls people uh, to return to God and to act justly. Um, the next slide uh, tells us uh, that the, the fire, the, the coal has touched his lips. So he hears the Lord speaking, whom shall I send who will go or walk? Remember the importance of walking in the Old Testament. We talked about that in the first session. Who's going to walk on our behalf? Who's going to represent us uh, before and, others? Okay. And I say, Isaiah says, here I am, send me. And so he is, uh, commissioned, he is sent on a mission to tell and show people how they are to walk with God again and with each other and indeed with the earth. Uh, and as we, if we could go to the next slide, Greg, are we struggling to do that? Um, oh, we seem to have missed one out. Um, just go, can you go back? Um, no, yes, one forward, that's it. <laughs> so Isaiah's lips are touched with fire the fire from God, the words he speaks become like words of fire. They sear and they purify those who hear them. And that's what I meant by uh, the prophet's words or the prophet's actions being like fire. They burn, but they don't destroy. They purify us so that we are ready, like the prophet, to go on a mission to bring about God's purposes on earth, to of his purposes of um, justice and of love, especially loving the Lord our God with all our heart and soul. So this was the call of the prophet Isaiah, but strangely this call of the prophet doesn't occur in chapter one of Isaiah, it occurs in the sixth chapter. Let's just go back now to the first chapter to see what Isaiah's message is. What does he go out to tell people? What words does the Lord put upon his lips? Isaiah begins by telling us that this is the vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So it sets these prophecies within a particular context. They are addressed to Judah and Jerusalem, that is the southern kingdom, the kings there who descend from King David and the people of that kingdom of Judah. We can uh, talk later in the questions again about um, the difference between this 
southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, to which some prophecies by other prophets are addressed. And we can date some of these oracles, prophecies, uh, because of the, they are dated back to these kings of Judah. What I want to say, focus on particularly, is some of that first message in chapter one. The prophet says, woe, 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 and thrice woe, the seeress used to say in up Pompeii, and prophets always do seem to have messages of doom and destruction. But now, as I indicate later, there's much more to them than just uh, messages of woe and doom. Anyway, the prophet announces disaster, doom perhaps, and gives reasons for this. The prophet accuses the people of what they have done. They have been sinful and they do evil. They have caused destruction. That is, they have upset those wonderful relationships with other human beings and indeed with the earth. And above all, they have abandoned, they have turned away from the Lord. This is the wrong that they have done. Okay, and if we just go on, Greg, um, and the Lord commands them, tells them what they have to do to change. They need to wash and clean. They above all need to cease to do evil and learn to do good. And what is good, it is to seek justice to restore right relationships with others, especially with the orphan and the widow and the oppressed, those who are poor, those who are victims, those who are the victims of society in the ancient societies, widows and orphans were very easily abandoned. They needed support for themselves to, to live and to flourish. So here, the concern of God, the concern of the prophet is with justice, with right relationships with others. And then the prophet goes on, if you have good sense and listen, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse to listen and are wayward, you rebel, you shall be eaten up by the sword. So the Lord, um, through the prophet, announces judgment. That judgment, as we saw in Deuteronomy, is up to the choice of the people. They can either face disaster if they refuse to listen, or they can uh, face um, the hope of restored relationships and the flourishing of the whole of the, the earth by listening to the Lord. So the message of um, God through the prophets is, I think, twofold. Firstly, we are to act justly. We are to be in right relationship with one another, remembering particularly the poor and the marginalized, and also, of course, to restore our relationship with the earth. And that relationship can just be so badly destroyed if we are not in, secondly, right relationship with God, with God. This accusation of the prophet is against um, those who act unjustly and those who abandon, who turn away from the Lord. I'm not going to focus today, because we haven't got time, on the call of the prophets to act justly. I want to focus instead, just for the remaining 10 minutes or so, upon the relationship that we have with the Lord and how the Lord is calling us back to right relationship with him. Having looked at this major prophet Isaiah, let's turn to one of the minor prophets, to Hosea, to see what is this evil that people do. We see there when Hosea was said to be operating, to be active as a prophet. We can come back to that later. But the main thing I want to say is that the uh, prophet announces disaster, um, there's going to be punishment visited upon the people, and why? What are they accused of? What have they done wrong? Firstly, they have, um, or sorry, above all, they have offered up smoke, that is sacrifice or incense, to the Baals, to other gods, and they have walked after uh, other gods as if they were their lovers. And so the prophet Hosea accuses the people of being unfaithful to the Lord God in the way that a spouse uh, is unfaithful to their, can be unfaithful to their spouse. So not always, a thought, of course, unfaithful, but can be unfaithful. Um, secondly, later on in Hosea, Hosea likens the people to what I'm terming here, a lost child, like the, the son in the prodigal son. The, the son has left home and gone away, forgets all about his loving father or loving parent. Uh, but the the father, the parent is always there calling them, calling to his children, asking them to come back, to walk. They've walked away, sacrificed to the bars, and he is calling them to come back. Let's just look at that more carefully now uh, in the 
prophet um, Joel, um, we've looked at what the people have been doing wrong. Basically, they've been walking away from the Lord and following, worshipping other gods. They are now exhorted, uh, they are pleaded with almost to do something, not just to cleanse themselves, to purify themselves, but above all, it's to return, to come back. Uh, this is an appropriate um, command, as it were, for us in Lent. It is the, um, the, the theme of Lent almost, return to me, come back to me, says the Lord. Yeah, this becomes in Greek metanoia or repentance, not just repent of your sins, but physically turn yourself around from the way you are going because you've been walking away from the Lord, now come back. And the Lord, uh, Prophet Joel, this famous uh, uh, verse, Return to me with all your heart, fasting and weeping and wailing. Uh, rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and full of tender mercy, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. These are the words that we heard God speak about himself on Mount Sinai in chapter 34 of Exodus. Here we see it's because God is always gracious and merciful, full of steadfast love. He's always there calling us back. This exhortation is not simply a command. It's not God in a gruff and booming voice saying, return. It's more that gentle, constant, almost throbbing heartbeat of the Lord saying, come back, here I am, like the father in the prodigal son. I'm waiting for you, I'm here, come back to me. So that is the key command, if you like, in the prophets that we should listen to in the, in the, through the prophetic voice, but also in the season of Lent, come back to me, return to me physically, turn aside from what you're doing, return physically to the Lord. Let's now just ha see how that theme is taken up in the second major prophet, in the prophet Jeremiah. You can read what it says there about the um, time that Jeremiah is said to be prophesying, particularly in the times of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, who were kings at the time that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came and uh, surrounded Jerusalem, mainly because uh, the kings were uh, not sending the tribute and rebelling against him almost. So he comes and he, he takes uh, Caesar's Jerusalem twice. The second uh, um, um, attack by Nebuchadnezzar involves the destruction of the city and importantly the destruction of the temple. And so that's the sort of context in which uh, Jeremiah is uh, prophesying. There's a very famous account there of his call, which is not just um, when he's a young man, but not only when he's in the womb, but before he was in the womb, almost before his conception, there's been this close relationship with God. If we just go to the next slide, Greg, we see here that Jeremiah, just like Hosea, his, oh, sorry, like Joel, his constant refrain is return, come back. Here in Jeremiah chapter three and chapter four, it's the constant refrain of the Lord God through the prophet saying, you've turned aside, you've, you've turned your back on me, Israel. Now you must come back because I'm full of steadfast love. You should know your iniquity, what you have done wrong. You have transgressed against the Lord your God. You've scattered your favors among strangers. That is, you've followed, uh, you've worshiped other gods. You've not listened to my voice. Remember the importance of listening uh, in, the, in the Torah the listening, the hero Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord, you've not been listening to me, so now return, return. Uh, and of course, the prophet Jeremiah uh, does uh, threaten disaster for the people, but in the midst of all this, these threats, there's also a wonderful annunciation, as it were, the prophet announces uh, things may change, things may be very different. Jeremiah, besides threatening the destruction of the city, Jerusalem, of the temple also announces hope for the people, the restoring of right relationships between God and his people. And of course, Jeremiah most famously does this in the language of covenant. Here it is, this famous text from Jeremiah chapter 31. See, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will cut, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It won't be like the covenant I cut with their ancestors, so it's going to be, as it were, something slightly different. It's not going to be doing away with the old. It doesn't mean the old covenant has been abolished, but it's not cutting a covenant in stone 
like the uh, tablets of stone on Mount Sinai. It's going to cut rather to the heart. This is where the covenant really always has been and should have been. Remember the covenant in the Old Testament. The people are to listen to the Lord their God and they're to put their words on their foreheads and on their arms and on their doorposts. And now basically the Lord is saying that is where the covenant with you is. I'm going to put my Torah, my law, my instructions for life. Uh, that which will help you flourish. I put that in your guts, right inside you. I'll write it on your heart. And this is the heart, the center, the focus of everything that I've had to say. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Or if we put it in the second person, I will be your God. You shall be my people now and always. This is the great promise of the Lord to his people, repeated again and again, and here in this promise of a new covenant with them in Jeremiah. It's put slightly differently in the third major prophet in Ezekiel. Let's just very quickly, in the few minutes remaining, turn to this third major prophet, to Ezekiel, who says um, in the 36th chapter, he says, I'm going to take you from the nations, I'm going to cleanse you, I'm going to throw pure water upon you and cleanse you, and I'm going to particularly, I'm going to give you a new heart, and a new spirit I'll put deep inside you, even in your guts. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You've not been listening, your, your, your heart has been almost turned to stone, you've turned away from my tenderness and gentleness, and now I'm going to take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Not, you'll not just give lip service to what I teach, but also your whole person is to be renewed. Now we must remember the context in which Ezekiel is prophesying. Jeremiah was preaching at the time that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, threatened uh, Jerusalem. What has happened is that the prophet Ezekiel has actually been captured. Um, Nebuchadnezzar took into captivity uh, the young king of Jerusalem, Jehoiakim, and probably Ezekiel and many other people in the first deportation. And ten years later, the, um, Nebuchadnezzar deports most of the, many of the people and also destroys the temple. Ezekiel is writing his prophecies uh, or speaking his prophecies in captivity in Babylon. All that is precious to him and to the people, his home, his city, his king, his temple, have all been lost. Even the Ark of the Covenant, as you know, disappears at this point. And yet Ezekiel, in all this, um, his prophecies again of the disaster that has now overtaken the people and their trauma at what has happened, provides hope for the future. He speaks at the end of his prophecies in the chapters 30s and the 40s of his prophecies of the restoration of the person. We've heard that. You have a new heart, so you as a person are going to be restored. The people of Israel are going to be restored. Remember, there are two kingdoms, two peoples of Israel and Judah. There's going to be one stick brought together, one people uh, of uh, Israel made up of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. There's going to be one king, and the Lord above all is going to be their king, their shepherd. And then finally, in the four chapters 40 to 48, nine chapters there of Ezekiel, the temple itself is to be restored. And this restoration of right relationships then extends uh, to, to the whole of reality. It's ourselves being right relationships, my heart in right relationship with him, my people and the earth as well as we'll see, because um, Ezekiel goes on to say, uh, can we just go back, Greg, to the previous slide? On that day when um, Israel, uh, the people of Israel have new hearts, I'll cause the towns to be dwelt in again, the waste places shall be rebuilt, the land that was desolated shall be tilled again. We will serve the land and we, the desolation will become like the Garden of Eden. So the earth too is restored because our relations with the Lord God are restored. I'm sorry, I've just gone over time slightly. We'll just quickly have a look now at concluding tonight by presenting the opening chapter of Ezekiel. because so I want you to just briefly to reflect on what is being said here. It talks about the presence of the Lord, but it's totally unlike the presence of the Lord that anybody seems to have experienced before and uh, is something very, very wonderful. Ezekiel is speaking here in the land of the Chaldeans, in the, uh, in the land of the Babylonians. 
by the river Chiba, somewhere near the river Euphrates. And he says, as I looked, a wind of storm came from the north, a great cloud and incessant fire and brightness all around it. In the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was a likeness of four living creatures. So again, fire, like we have fire of the burning bush and the fire of the seraphim and the coal in the temple with Isaiah. Fire again seems to somehow be associated with the presence of the Lord. And then over, there are the likeness of four living creatures and Ezekiel describes what these creatures look like. And over the heads of the living creatures, there's a likeness of a dome and it's like shining crystal. And above the dome, there's a likeness of a throne. Upon the likeness of a throne, there's a likeness of the appearance of a man, of an Adam, of a human being. It's, it's something which is like things that he can experience, like thrones and fire and, and, a, and a human being, but it's also something totally unlike that. And as he concludes at the next slide, Greg, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord the Kavod Adonai that we've seen before, that Kavod Adonai that descended upon the tent of meeting at the end of Exodus. And so here it is. Language fails uh, Ezekiel with this encounter with the living Lord. It's like and unlike things that he's experienced. But uh, what he's trying to do here is define as much as he can the overwhelming presence of what it's like to be in the presence of the Lord, something which is so the Lord who is totally other, but also totally present with his people. And what's being said here is that Ezekiel is sitting in Babylon. The temple has been destroyed where God has dwelt with his people. But here, that's not the end of things. God is with Ezekiel here, sitting by the river Chiba in, uh, in the, the land of the Babylonians. And so uh, the temple may have been destroyed, his city may have been destroyed, his king may be, be in captivity. But the Lord, the living Lord, is still with his people in exile, just as he was walking with his people in their exodus from Egypt. And so Ezekiel, above all, I think, celebrates the wonder and overwhelming rapture of the Lord's presence and reveals, of course, the God who tells Moses, I am who I am and I will be with you whenever, wherever you are now, this moment and always. Okay, <laughs> I was get, getting a bit rapturous and carried away too. Um, I, as usual, I've rushed through things. I'm sure there's a lot there for you to reflect on. In a moment, we're going to look at a few of those passages, and one or two other passages again, to read them slowly and prayerfully. And hopefully uh, some of the things I've said, and indeed some of the words that you've read may strike you in new ways and draw you deeper into the wonder of living and walking with our God. Before I do that, I'd just like to um, say last, next week will be the last of our sessions, um, but after Easter, we're going to continue looking at the Bible. Father Mark Yarmush is going to lead us for five sessions, uh, not in Easter week, but the week after that, beginning on the 12th of April. Uh, looking, at, looking at people's responses to the resurrection in the New Testament, looking at the women and Peter, the disciples as a whole, looking at the disciples on their way to Emmaus and the beloved disciple as well. So I do hope you'll join us for that as well. Same time, seven till eight o'clock on Mondays, beginning the 12th of April, with a little gap in the middle for bank holiday at the beginning of May. Um, so I do hope you'll come to that. Uh, it may be now that some of you um, are going to leave us, and uh, I hope you have um, enjoyed tonight and uh, wish you a, a good evening and hope you return to see us again next week as we look at uh, the Psalms, which is a, a very exciting, um, very exciting, very exciting text, very interesting. Okay, let's now just quietly reflect on some of these words of fire from our prophets one or two of the texts we have looked at this week, and one or two we have not. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. His robe filled the temple.
seraphim were in attendance above him. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. But I said, Woe is me. I am lost. My lips are unclean. And yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, holding a live coal that he had taken from the altar. The seraph touched my mouth with the coal and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your sin is taken away. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. We've not had time to look at many of the prophecies of Isaiah, but many of his prophecies are very well known to us as Christians, and I've just chosen two. The Lord himself will give you a sign the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel, which as St. Matthew tells us is a name which means God with us. A voice cries, in the wilderness clear the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. This text marks a new point in the prophecies of Isaiah, to which we could return later in the questions and discussion. Let's move on to just reflect on two of those prophecies of our relationship with God being restored. Firstly, from Jeremiah. This is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people.
and from the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And next we have uh, a text we did not look at. We looked at the prophet Hosea, who spoke very powerfully about how we have been unfaithful to God, as perhaps sometimes we don't remember people like the prodigal son, or sometimes we are unfaithful to those we most love. But the Lord is always faithful, and this is what he says in the second chapter of Hosea. I will take you for my spouse, my betrothed, forever. I will take you for my spouse in righteousness and in justice in steadfast love and in tender mercy. I will take you for my spouse in faithfulness. You shall know the Lord. Lord reveals himself in righteousness and justice and steadfast love and tender mercy and faithfulness, and he invites us to walk with him in these ways, so that a deep and intimate knowledge and relationship of the Lord may be restored within us. Finally, as the prophet Micah says, we haven't looked at him at all, but I'd just like to leave you with um, these, this uh, lovely verse, which I'm sure you all know, just for us to reflect on tonight. What does the Lord ask of you but to do justice To love with steadfast love, to walk humbly with your God. I do hope um, you will found something of interest tonight, and that these words of the Lord, of the Lord through the prophets, has spoken deep into your hearts today. Um, as usual, perhaps at this time, some people will be leaving us. So it's been lovely uh, to have you with us tonight, and look forward to seeing you next week. Just for the next ten minutes, though, we're going. To, the rest of us are going to go into breakout rooms and there'll be the same questions as usual to reflect on. 
um, what has brought you to this evening, is that some particular interest you have in Isaiah and uh, the prophets, uh, or it may just be again to think about what has interested you in the Old Testament, or and that may have been developing over these weeks. And then in that time of quiet, or indeed throughout the evening, what words or phrases have stood out for you as you've been listening tonight? Or what thoughts or questions have come into your mind as we explored these passages together? So um, I think people look to have left anyway, so I was just going to say goodbye again to those who are leaving us. So um, um, see, see some of you next week, but the rest of us, Greg's going to put us now into uh, breakout rooms. We'll see you all again in 10 minutes time. We struggle. Sorry, if there we are, everybody. As usual, you should just be able to click on the link to follow it to to join a breakout room. However, if you would rather uh, not join a breakout room and you just want to stay here until uh, everybody else rejoins the main session, that's absolutely fine. But um, otherwise, you should just be able to click through to, to join a breakout room if you'd like to join in the, the discussion. Uh, otherwise, everybody will be back in about 10 minutes. Um, so far. Um, as, as I've uh, said, usually at this point in previous weeks, uh, it may be that some of you uh, haven't got the time or don't want to stay for the next 30 minutes, so, but I uh, hope to see uh, many of you next week. And as I mentioned earlier, don't forget, um, not um, Holy Week or Easter week, there won't be a, a time together, but do come back for the talks on the uh, risen Jesus, encountering the risen Jesus with Father Mark after Easter beginning, I think, was it the 12th of April, Greg? And that's right, isn't it? Anyway, Greg's going to send out information about this. So, but something that I'll be interested in uh, very much, so I think, I think it's a very interesting topic, this, uh, what effect did the risen Jesus have on the people mm -hmm. who first encountered him? Uh, extraordinary. Anyway, so- Can I ask a basic question? Yes. Um, you speak always as if there were just, all the way through, as if there were just one Isaiah. Yes. Because in fact there were two or at least three, weren't there? Were what there? was the time span? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Can I just, before I, thank you very much, that's great asking that question, it's very important. Just to say goodbye to those who are not staying, if there's anybody going, that's uh, Sorry for interrupting. Thank well, you. Sir. It's quite all right, thank you. Look, thank you. Tell you. me next, please. I'll see you next week. Um, Hi, thank you, Father. Um, your question will encourage others to stay for the answer, if there is an answer. Um, okay, so as I said earlier, the, uh, all the prophets um, are made up really of, of um, <laughs> well, this poetry, which we didn't look at, they're all, they're, they're all poetical texts, or, or most mm. of them are. Uh, so there's a very interesting way of looking at poetry in, uh, in, uh, in Hebrew, but we can talk about that later on. Um, but the big thing is that it, it doesn't have a sort of narrative flow. And some of these texts have um, seem to have particular contexts. So um, all, all the texts in Isaiah are attributed um, to the time um, that it says yes. in the, for, are said to be written uh, or, 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 or pr pronounced, not written down, but the, Isaiah was said to be prophesying these prophecies at the time uh, of um, King Uzziah and Ahaz and Hezekiah around the late 700s BC. Um, the problem is this is say these are a collection of poems. It's more like an anthology of 
uh, of texts. We have no means really of dating these texts. Um, did Isaiah actually write anything, or are some of them oracles that somebody else wrote down on his behalf? Scholars do think that some of these oracles, these prophecies, do date back to the time of Isaiah, particularly uh, that text we just heard tonight, the story, uh, the prophecy of a woman being with child, those prophecies which were said to be around the time of King Ahaz, around 734, 732 BC. However, as scholars have looked at these texts, they've noticed that um, quite a few of them probably have, would suit a better context later on. Particularly, um, uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1, for example, which mentions a King Cyrus. And Cyrus, King Cyrus, is held up as a, a savior, a messiah for the people. And um, King Cyrus uh, did not live in the 700s BC. King Cyrus was the <coughs> king of Persia who conquered the Babylonian Empire and who is said, uh, according to the Bible, to have allowed uh, the people to go, who had been taken into captivity in Babylon, not just the uh, people of Israel, but many people to return to their homelands. So King Cyrus yeah. certainly lived in the, in the five, uh, th 40s and 30s BC, a long time after Isaiah was prophesying. So either Isaiah is a very good prophet and knows, can prophesy the name of a king uh, 200 years later and what he's going to do 150 mm -hmm. years later. Or in fact, those prophecies were written, written quite a lot later. And very early on, people saw that there was a big change in chapter 40 of Isaiah, which is why I gave you that text from um, Comfort Ye, Comfort Ye, My People, uh, Prepare a Way for the Lord. It's not just a prophecy, a prophesy in the coming of the Messiah or the coming of John the Baptist. It's also uh, the text that marks the change from what is traditionally called now first Isaiah to second Isaiah. So scholars say, have said over the last two, three hundred, no, that's a bit exaggerated, over the last 200 years, even 150 years, that um, there are at least two prophets or two sets of oracles going on here. Many of the oracles of chapters 1 to 39 belong to the first Isaiah, perhaps the Isaiah who was prophesying and perhaps writing his oracles down in the 700s BC. But then second Isaiah, another prophet was writing from chapter 40 in, um, in, the, uh, five, five, in the middle of the 6th century BC in the 500s. Other scholars have then said, well, actually, um, those, those, the, the texts between chapters 40 and chapters 55 do seem to be very similar. There seems to be a similar style and themes and so on and so on. We can see that they perhaps are from one prophetic voice. But then there's another big change in chapter 56. And many of the texts at the end of our We're lo losing you, Timothy. Could I just say something in here that better, scholars have thought? Uh, yes. Uh, could I come in briefly here? The reason why we say there's a division at 40 is that there's three chapters, uh, 37 to 39, that seem to be lifted straight out of two kings. Yeah. Uh, almost identical to similar chapters in two kings. But then 35 could be part of the 40 plus section because it's got therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with seeing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be on their heads but um, I do think there's more than one Isaiah but I'm no scholar <laughs> yeah, I almost wish I hadn't asked the question so, so what I'm presenting is the scholarly um, consensus really at the end of the 19th century <laughs> so this was 120 130 years ago <laughs> So we are the heirs to this idea that there are three Isaiahs. Um, and it makes a lot of sense with second Isaiah, perhaps that you have one prophetic voice or at least a school of prophets perhaps, probably writing about, you know, in the Babylonian, at the time of the Babylonian exile. But as you say quite rightly, Bob, the problem with the first Isaiah is that there, that there seems to be a lot of different styles. And as you say, chapter 35 is very similar to chapter 40. And so are we speaking, can we attribute all these oracles to the to, to the, the Isaiah of Jerusalem, the Isaiah of the 700s, or have we got lots of uh, different prophets writing over the next uh, few centuries? And that would be where scholars would be thinking more recently in the last uh, 50 years, let's say. But then um, 
that, that caused the problem for others, also for some people to say, isn't this terrible if this can't be dates back to the, to the uh, they, these are all, all from the prophet Isaiah. But that's not really how the tradition builds up. Uh, these are things that, um, these are things which um, uh, the prophet Isaiah, uh, who, 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 who lived and prophesied uh, this character that we are has come down to us in the 700s BC. These are the sort of things that he was saying. Many of the things may indeed date back, many of the oracles may indeed date back to this time, uh, but others have been added to them. And this is how, but they are, as it were, in the style, in the school of Isaiah, and uh, this is how tradition is handed down. We, we continue, the rabbis continue to interpret the prophets, but this was done, if you like, uh, in the in the decades and even hundreds of years after Isaiah, th things were added uh, to put his oracles in new context. So when there was the Babylonian exile, and when Cyrus released the people from exile, then it may be right that uh, people writing it, as it were, added to that those texts from Isaiah. And these have been um, 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 taken by the people of Israel, by the Jews, and indeed by the uh, by our church. They are taken to be authentic messages from the prophet Isaiah. Could I, sorry, just briefly, the most important thing for us is that they predate Christ. We're absolutely certain that the prophecies that we have, with the possible exception of a, a little bit of Daniel, predates Christ. And we need to take it as, and we take it as prophecies about Christ to a great extent, uh, as well as telling us how we ought to be living. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. That's how we understand it. Uh, and um, clearly the early church also took these to be prophecies of Christ. But they also have, uh, if we can recreate, try, scholars have tried to recreate the original context and see what it would mean in those original contexts and what mm -hmm. it means to the people of Israel as a whole. Yeah. It, um, I, I, I've just seen uh, John's sent a message and uh john joyce and i think john you sent it to me directly well I, I wonder if whether that was actually a question you you a different question you wanted to raise for, for father tim or for everyone to discuss no um so what what i put father was um is prophecy alive and well today or did it become redundant after the coming of the lord in person well i think perhaps as bob has hinted really that prophecy as it was uh <laughs> Which was look, looking forward to the coming of, of Christ. Uh, it, it's not ha, has ended. There are no more prophets in that sense, and no more prophets uh, that will be accepted within Israel, as it were. Also, in terms of the uh, the canonical books of the prophets is closed. Um, however, as we know from the New Testament, there are people who are described as prophets. So it's uh, it seems to be a particular particular charism that some people have. And if we think of what the prophets are doing, that they are those who have become so close to the Lord and who, um, who uh, challenge us in the Lord's name, who bring us back to justice and walking the way of love. Um, we, we think of in, our, in, in more recent years, people like Martin Luther King, we talk of him as a prophet, mm. Mother Teresa as a prophet, uh, speaking radically for the uh, respect for the marginalized the poor so uh, prophecy in one sense is is very much uh, alive and indeed uh, um, it's how we discern prophets i suppose clearly the people of israel over the centuries discerned that particular uh, people from their past were prophets and certain texts that came down from were prophetical texts uh, we too as a church i had to discern who are prophets in our turn of time we don't give them uh, official recognition like we do with saints, <laughs> or the saints in, um, or saints have to be dead to be officially uh, canonized, I suppose. But we do, we do, we do recognize people um, unofficially, as it were, as prophets, those who who speak for the Lord because of what they say, being in accordance with, uh, being in accordance with what the Lord seems to be saying through the prophets that we are to walk justly or act justly and walk humbly with our God and they witness to that in their lives and indeed more particularly with what they say because pro prophecy has something to do of course with words um, and speech. Um, just uh, I, I wonder if uh, Michael just had a, 
a short comment uh, he, he shared in, in the chat with somebody maybe maybe Michael would you like to, to share that with everybody uh, out loud as, as well and then I think Sandra might have a question right sorry I had trouble unmuting um, in a sense I think that what I was uh, commenting on um, were, was what Father Tim actually was saying at the time that the um, um, the, the prophets, they are, have a, a, a significance for the people with whom they are living mm. and indeed for future generations, Be, but they're essentially talking about the present rather than the future. Um, yeah. And because we've got this book called The Prophets and um, the uh, that, that, that section contains quite a few prophecies, with, um, statements which seem to apply to Christ and have, have been applied since the, um, indeed since Jesus' time, since Jesus' own words to him, then we've tended sometimes to rather um, focus on that side of um, prophecy rather than on the broader meaning of prophecy, because who was the greatest of the prophets in the Old Testament? The first quotation from Father Tim actually said Moses. John the Baptist. No, no, before, sorry, in the Old Testament. I know, but that's what Jesus said. Uh, yes, okay then, John the Baptist, but Moses, well, Okay, um, but it, you know, so and Moses, we would not think of Moses as one of the prophets and Moses didn't so much talk about what was going to happen. He spoke God's word to the people of Israel. He was the conduit through which God was able to speak to the people of Israel at his time. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, I think are the same. So the, it's important to listen to what the prophets have to say to us in our situation, that was how I would read it. And then certainly, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, the, the Christological um, import. I mean, all of the Old Testament was seen in the early church as foreshadowing uh, Christ in different ways, not only in prophecy, but for example, the serpent raised up in the desert was seen as a, um, a symbol of Christ. So everything in the Old Testament was interpreted by the church fathers uh, um, as relevant to Christ himself as well. So there's that aspect of the prophets, yes, but what are they telling us about what God wants us to do? And I think that was where, Father Tim, you, you said, you know, sort of the um, uh, um, live justly, um, love with hesed, and um, walk humbly with your God, you know, sort of th th that sort of um, message is for each generation and that's why we, this is part of the scripture because it speaks god's word universally sorry that was a bit long no it's lovely thank you michael that's beautifully put <laughs> thank you yes thanks michael and did um, uh i noticed that sandra had a, a question which i'm sure uh, tim would be uh, very happy to answer about uh his translation of of, of the hebrew of, of jeremiah 30 30 wombus. 33. Sandra, would you like to ask a question? I'm sure Tim will be, we'll, we'll, we'll love that one. Yes, it was just our group were wondering if the use of the word guts in the version you used for Jeremiah 31, 33, we were just wondering if that's a direct translation from the Hebrew or whether it's uh, another version of scripture that um, the church is moving across to with the new missile. Um, just it seemed to me to make the verse come across much more powerfully you know, when you hear a different word from the one that you used to use it. Um, I would say it's my translation, so uh, you won't be hearing it in church, I don't think. Uh, we actually talked about it in our chat quite a bit. When I was asked, um, when I was leaving seminary, what would be my motto as a priest? <laughs> um, I thought quickly, I, I decided I'd, I'd do the game, my own translation from uh, the Benedictus uh, in Zechariah's uh, prophecy, uh, which, um, where, where he speaks about the, the the, um, the the mercy of God from on high. I said something more like um, uh, the, 
immersive from the guts. So guts is a big word for me. I think guts is a big thing in the, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. It's my own translation because usually it would say, put my Torah in there, in, in, within them. Um, and, but it, but it is actually the, the word that is used, Kerev, it, it's, it's not just a, it's not just a, a, a vague abstract preposition, it's actually a thing. And so it, it can mean the, the, the inner part of you, the seat of your thought and your emotions, that which makes you yourself, I suppose. It can also, it can also be used as a preposition, so it can also mean in your, in your, in the, in, inside you, within you, or indeed in your midst. Uh, so it could be the Torah is not only going to be within me, but with, with us. But it's also the word that is actually used for the entrails and the sacrifices in the sacrificial texts. Mm. That's why I chose to translate it as guts. And I think it sort of says, it, it gets something, it makes us think again about this text. And, and that's what we, we had quite a long chat in our, in our, in our uh, breakout group about this. And I think it's a very beautiful thing. So, well, John said it, uh, he's here somewhere. Um, some lovely things said about what that could mean. And I think it, by translating that, it, I think it's helped me to think about that that text again. Yes, um, thanks, thanks, Dr. Simon. Just, just to continue to uh, encourage people to, to ask any questions, well, I, either just to raise your, your hand or, or to put them in the chat. Um, I think Bob and, and Anna both just had uh, perhaps brief comments to make, just returning to the, the contemporary role of, of prophets today, but people might, uh, so maybe Bob and Anna might just briefly uh, Mention those to people, but uh, if people do have any other questions, please uh, please type do type those in the chat. Yes, I just saw Bob's message about the bowels in the diaremes version. That's quite right. So I mean, yeah, I mean, um, when it uses the reason I said guts from um, mercy from the guts is from the guts of God, as it were, because one of the um, in, in the Greek it's splanky, which is the intestines, which is often is also the word used for compassion, because you're feeling from that which is deep within you. <laughs> uh, and God is often said to, or Jesus is said to, uh, to feel in that way from the guts. Uh, that's why I think of mercy from the guts of God. Yeah, could I just come in about yeah. prophecy that uh, there's one prophet who appears twice in the, in, in the New Testament, Agabus. He first predicts the famine which leads to the collection of the church in Jerusalem. And then later on, he takes Paul's belt and ties himself up in it and says, this is what will happen to the person that belongs to this, this, this belt belongs to. Uh, prophets, are mentioned, prophets are mentioned quite a lot in the New Testament, but there's only, there's only, there's only two occasions where it's actually mentioned what they say. Uh, I'm just, it's a question of how much should we give, be expecting prophets to be foretelling the future in the way that Moses said that uh, you can judge a prophet by what he if what he says comes true he's a prophet if he makes wild predictions that don't happen then he isn't yeah but well, thanks Bob I mean, that's very interesting I I don't really have any um, immediate answers um, or, well I suppose we're struggling together to, to come to answers aren't we um, I just something to think about oh. just something to think about but it's also I mean, you're bringing, raising all sorts of interesting questions that scholars have done about what, what is a prophet and this mention of what makes a true prophet and a false prophet. And that's a big theme in, in the prophetical literature and indeed uh, in, the, in the historical books about what is it, what is it what, how, can you, how can you distinguish a, a true prophet from a false prophet? It does seem to have something, the idea of it coming true, and it does seem to have something to do with the future. But then, um, you know, we're also judging from the present once things have come, once things have actually taken place. Um, Greg might have some interesting thoughts on this. I was going to say something. Oh, I mean, there's also the traditional way of talking about prophets as not so much in the, in the Bible, as not so much being forth tellers, which is what we tend to um, colloquially think of a prophet as being someone who tells. <clears throat> there is that aspect, which is most difficult to deal with. But it's perhaps more important that they are they are forth tellers. They speak forth uh, God's message. Um, that's um, that's clear there. And if it, I, I tried to look at the etymology of um, prophet uh, from this word, na the word navi, having something to do with calling and invoking, 
invoke the Lord, you call upon the Lord. But our word prophet actually comes from the Greek meaning uh, to speak before. And if you think about what speak before means, it means either before something happens, which may give us that idea of a prophet telling us something that happens before it happens, or it could also be um, speaking in the presence of before people. I'm not sure that's answering your question. It's not the answer to the question. If anybody else has other thoughts on this uh, question of, um, of prophecy in the New Testament and or prophets, sorry, prophets um, in the church, um, or while you're thinking about that, if anybody does, and Greg has anything to come back on from the chat or himself, um, can I just go back to this question you began with about? first and second and third Isaiah. I think what I was trying to do is to say that there was this scholarly thesis that grew up, that there were three Isaiahs. And I think as Bob, for example, quite rightly said, there are all sorts of holes in that idea. Um, and often you'll see different commentaries put into three volumes or some introductions done as, you have an introduction to first Isaiah and an introduction to second Isaiah. Well, this is really just a scholarly hypothesis. So I much prefer as trying to look at Isaiah as a whole, even if we can't date the individual words and prophecies, we can at least try and see what the whole of Isaiah that has come back down to us is trying to say. I think that produces uh, very interesting reflections. That's interesting about Bob Dylan, thank you. Yes, yeah, there's uh, some interesting comments from, from Bob and, and Malcolm about the idea that, um, well, about the question, I suppose, uh, of the extent to which uh, what's going to happen in the future is sort of naturally perceptible, so that prophets don't necessarily need particular divine inspiration to, to see it. Although I think it, I, I mean, clearly, um, I think in the biblical presentation, it's fair to say that um, divine, um, a divine calling and some sort of communication from God is very central to the to the role of prophets, as we saw with uh, with Moses. Um, I don't know if sorry, there's quite a few comments there. I think probably people have, will have been able to um, to read through them. But if anybody's uh, very especially eager to share something that they've that they've uh, written in a comment there, I out loud, out loud, please feel free to do, do so. If, or if we have any more questions, actually, Paddy, uh, I noticed you have a question. Uh well, I was just going to say we, we um, spoke more about prophecy in the term, well, we, we mentioned prophecy in terms of uh, speaking truth to power, shall we say. It's the speaking the truth about what is going on and what we should be doing and so on. Uh, I'd also said that prophets didn't necessarily get treated very well and the same can happen today. <laughs> yes, that's right, Paddy. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. No, uh, no, I think that's quite right. It's, it's, it's that sort of penetration to the heart. Um, although, as I said earlier, which I think is uh, getting to the heart of the matter, which often unsettles us. And uh, I think going back to Eden, it's that sense of when faced with the truth, Adam and Eve hid. Whereas faced with the truth, David, who was not said to be a prophet, but David didn't hide. He admitted what he had done wrong. And in a sense, the prophet is there, well, that Nathan, of course, exposes that wrong, and our response to that um, clear um, enunciation or telling of wrong, uh, we should not seek to hide from, but to to freely admit if it is true that we have we have done wrong and that we need to return to the Lord's ways. Um. Thanks, for Tim. Uh, an interesting sort of question uh, now from, from Anna uh, about sort of um, this question of God putting his law into the hearts of, of people as part of the, the new covenant in Jeremiah and elsewhere in the in, in the, the Old Testament. Um, Anna, would you like to just to sort of to, to, yeah, to, to read that question or to phrase it in your own words? Um. It just resounded with me. In Jeremiah, it says, I will put my law within them. And I started thinking about in Romans, St. Paul talks about even the Gentiles having an understanding of the law written on their hearts. But then a big question kind of arose in my mind about this idea of at what point did, the, did we have that understanding? Because for me, um, Aquinas', Aquinas natural law teaches us that at the beginning of 
well, humankind are built to have an understanding because they're built by, by God for a purpose. And therefore, intrinsically, we know the law within us and we, we're predisposed towards good or predisposed and away from evil. Um, so I just wanted to double check in terms of the tents. I will put my law within them. I know it's a new covenant being established. But was there was there a law there before that or is this a new law that's being put within them? If that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's really a question more for Greg. <laughs> While I'm looking at what the text. I was going to say it was in. Yeah, I, I thought this is this is a, a really interesting question, and and actually in a way it comes to one of the big kind of debates in theology in in the 20th century and now the 21st century amongst most Catholics trying to understand, if you like, the relationship between God's special presence and revelation, which is, uh, which we call, amongst other things, grace, and then the sort of natural knowledge and relationship with God, which people can also have, which, unlike, say, the Reformed tradition, Catholicism has maintained, existed in some way, even after the fall. So in a way, your question, I guess, is about whether or not those two things are ever really historically separated, whether or not God's presence, um, God's intimate presence within people uh, is something diffused throughout space and time, or whether it's something which occurs in some sort of special eschatological state, say, after, uh, after Pentecost, perhaps. Um, and I I mean, this is a huge debate, which is ongoing among, between Catholic theologians, so they might want to read it in different ways. But I think we, we could say just um, maybe a, a couple of things. Um, I'm just trying to think about what Aquinas might say about this. Um, and when Aquinas is talking, uh, Aquinas talks about different ways in which we know how to follow God. Um, and he he distinguishes, so on the one hand, yeah, you're right, and he talks about the, the natural law, which might be similar to what Paul writes about in Romans uh, 2, when he talks about people having a, an instinctive knowledge of God. He, Paul writes, for example, 2 verse 14, uh, when Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these then not having the law are a law to themselves. They show that the, what the law requires is written on their hearts. Okay, I think that's the passage which you were thinking of. So Aquinas would def and uh, pe other people in the tradition like him definitely want to affirm that Gentiles have some sort of knowledge of God, but it's worth noting that then when when Paul is talking um, is talking about, the, he's, he's not really talking about people's, this knowledge in a very, po in an entirely positive way. There's, there's also this idea that um, God has somehow, this knowledge has somehow become uh, become darkened uh, perhaps that people have sort of um given up on this this knowledge in romans do but also we i mean so i think the historical answer would have been something like this people have some sort of knowledge of god through through natural law but maybe that's become darkened and damaged but then they have an extra special knowledge of god through grace even this kind of intimate instinctive knowledge of god and somebody like aquinas would discuss this when he talks about the uh, gift of infused wisdom or, or sapientia. Um, so if you want to look, look at what Aquinas thinks about that, look at uh, Aquinas's work in the, um, is it the prima secunda pars of the, the summer where he talks about the gift of wisdom after he's talked about faith. Sorry, that was a rather scholarly and, and, and not a very helpful answer. But I think, I guess the overall picture is something like this. There might be an intimate growth, a growth in this intimate knowledge which people have of God. But there's lots of debate amongst theologians as to whether historically that ever goes from being a purely natural knowledge into a purely gracious knowledge or whether really all that everybody's doing is gracious, a bit like in Isaiah with the whole earth being full of God's, God's glory. So that's a debate which I won't try and solve. Anyway, sorry. Can I also just add, I'm sorry, Greg, I haven't quite worked because I've been busy looking up um, the text. And I'm afraid, actually, I just probably, because I have a base translation, which is the NRSV that I've downloaded and I just adapt it. And actually, there are two forms of the verb in Hebrew. One is a complete action, completed action, one is incomplete. And this is actually the completed action. So it should have said, I have put, or I, 
it would be a better translation, I have put my law in their guts. Uh, so I'm sorry about that. that. That's just also interesting as well. Um, I mean, it's very difficult in poetry also to quite get those tenses right, but this, definitely, this is definitely the form of a verb which is, um, which is completed action. Mm. Mm. That's, sorry, that just throws another interesting thing. So thank you also for pointing that out. When I read some translators again, I shall correct that. <laughs> in, in in my Bible, it's the same. It says, I will put, yeah. which is why I queried it. So it's wrong in here as well, then. Yeah, well, I think most people probably put that. I think it's it's always difficult to know quite how to translate the tense of verbs. But it's very clearly, um, it, there are only two forms of verb, and you have to decide whether it's the complete action or the incomplete. You can, you can translate an incomplete form as present or future, or indeed as a mobile as may, might, should, and so on. But this one is definitely one that is complete, would usually be a past tense, or, a, 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 yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now becoming complicated in terms of grammar, <laughs> it's a Hebrew language, which, so I hope most people haven't switched off completely now. <laughs> oh, could I just add a, a little into that? Um, I've, my own, from my own experience, if, if having some sort of grace-filled experience, I seem to move from just trying to avoid doing what's wrong to wanting to do what's right. And that would seem, you know, almost like God putting something into me. If it's with his help, it is grace. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry we've um, moved into very difficult areas. <laughs> Does anybody else? Uh, this is over time, actually. Um, but thank you for um, being here tonight. And um, I look forward to um, seeing um, more of you, more of you, all of you next week. <laughs> and uh, oh, it's, it's quite exhausting, all these uh, questions. Thank you. <laughs> Look forward to uh, thank you, Greg, for being here and for helping us. And see you all next week, um, hopefully. And um, bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye, thank you. Have a good week. <laughs>